good morning, everybody. And uh, I do appreciate that all of you have braved the storm this morning to come and uh, listen about uh, Joan of Arc. And Joan of Arc, I guarantee you, will not disappoint. She is absolutely fantastic. Um, but before I do that, I have to go back to last week and tell you the things that I left out from last week. So it's been said that Genghis Khan uh, has produced more children than anybody else. Here's a hand up for you. While that cannot be proven, um, it is true that there's an awful lot of Genghis Khan DNA still roaming around China and the rest of the world. Also, last time I kind of blanked when I was trying to describe or, uh, the number of towers that were around the wall of Beijing. Um, it's 90, supposedly, uh, towers that were around the walls of Beijing. Also, one thing that was kind of interesting about the style of fighting that the uh, Mongols used, they did not like hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so, when, whenever they surrounded uh, like several thousand soldiers, they did not want to close in and just slaughter them one at a time like that, because that was, that was kind of ugly sort of fighting. So what they would do, they would open up their ranks and let them escape. And as they were escaping in their long line strung out, then they would attack them again and slaughter them. They found that was a lot easier to do than surrounding and clubbing them all to death. Okay, so Joan of Arc. Um, oh, another thing that I wanted to hear. Oh, you already got it. Um, another thing that I wanted to do. Uh, somebody had asked about a bibliography if I could go over some of the works uh, that have been covered on these various characters. So I, I thought I'd do that too. Um, there's a couple of books that um, that I found are really good and really short for people who don't want to spend the next three months reading about a given character. When I was teaching junior high, uh, very frequently I would tell my students that I loved, I absolutely loved children's literature on history. Um, could we have some? Thank you. Because if, if you know nothing about a character, it's not always the smart thing to do to buy a 500 page uh, book to uh, find out about somebody you don't know anything about. Because you start it and you kind of get lost in it because there's a lot of things that are new and so it's a little difficult. If you pick out something nice and short, a couple hundred pages, 150 pages, and that's what these first two of them are. Um, Polly Brooks, Beyond the Myth, The Story of Joan of Arc, that's written for teens, but it's written very well. And it's only, it's under 200 pages, and so it's, it's a good short read that's, that's not filled with a lot of fluff like some teen books would be. Uh, Mary Gordon wrote a uh, short uh, book on Joan of Arc as well. It's, it's for adults, and um, it's pretty good. Uh, the next one is, is really good because it has a lot of the court records. Joan of Arc, her own voice, and voices of witnesses. One of the great things, and we'll get into this a little later, one of the great things about the history studying Joan of Arc is we know a lot about her because of court records that were saved. And so we have her own voice on her upbringing, and the voices that she heard and the things that she went through. Um, so this book, Joan of Arc by herself and her witnesses, is great in that it has a lot of really great quotes of Joan of Arc, although it does tend to get a bit, um, 
it, it's a bit disorganized for me. It, it wasn't the guy who put it together. Um, I don't know. It, it just didn't come across as well to me as, as it should have. And then there's a good full length uh, biography, Catherine Harrison, Joan of Arc, 382 pages. And she does a pretty good job. She incorporates a lot of the literature uh, of people who have written about Joan of Arc in fiction. And so she, she incorporates that, but letting you know that this is what the fiction has to say and this is what we know has happened. So Joan has been a great inspiration for many people over the ages. Thank you. Excuse me. From all walks of life, people that you wouldn't think would be inspired by a woman such as Joan of Arc have been. Whether in writers, artists, politicians, philosophers, men and women, Catholics and Protestants, communists and monarchists, um, down through the ages, there have been many people from, like I said, from many different angles who just absolutely love Joan of Arc and use her to promote their own ideas. And of course, we have the Joan of Arc hairdo. In 1909, 1909, a, a, a French uh, hairdresser came up with this look because she was, she was making a big comeback. People were really thinking about Joan of Arc. And so he started promoting this Joan of Arc hairdo and it really caught on. As we know, the flappers in the 1920s loved this hairdo. This was Joan of Arc inspired. <laughs> yes. Why do we call her Joan in English? Because the Jean is a perfectly good woman's name, and that's her name in French. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you, you'd think it would be, because um, she called herself Jeanette also. But more importantly, why do we call her Joan of Arc? That's not her name. It never was her name. That was a much later uh, corruption of her family name. Um, it is interesting that uh, in her court trial, when she was on trial, they asked her her name and her last name. She didn't know that she had a last name. This was back in the time when last names were not necessary, or when they were, it was, it was more for the nobility to have last names. As you go down the socioeconomic ladder, men generally would start to take, in the 1300s and 1400s, they started taking last names. Uh, women sometimes would take last names, and not necessarily the man's. They didn't necessarily have to go together. Um, Joan's father's last name was Dark, D apostrophe A R C. It, the English later on thought that meant of Arc. It does not. There is no Arc in France. They were not from any town of that name. But I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Um, the Hundred Years' War, that's what this was all about. The Hundred Years' War, and as you can see, it was 116 years, not 100 years, but 116 years war doesn't have that same <laughs> kick to it. Um, France and England were fighting over the crown of France. One of the things that um, royalty did back in those days, if you were to marry, you married royalty. And sometimes you had to go to another country or get someone from another country to do it. And sometimes it was an alliance between the two countries. And so when the king of England, or a prince of England who would become king, marries the daughter of a French king and has children, and then the French king who has sons who all passed away without having any sons, you have a problem. Because who's going to inherit 
the throne. Well, naturally, a French, the French don't want an English person to inherit. The English definitely do want uh, an Englishman to inherit. So that's really what this was all about. But it was, it was really something that was going to happen anyway. Um, France and England, since, as you know, 1066, a very famous year, William the Conqueror comes over and conquers England. So we have the Normans and the Saxons fighting it out in England for many years. But William the Conqueror was William of Normandy. He was the ruler of Normandy. So even though he became the English king, he still had territories in uh, France. And over the years, uh, the English monarchs had various territories um, in England and in, in France. And so they were constantly fighting over the territories in France. Henry V and Charles VI. Henry V, famous great battle and uh, that Shakespeare did, Henry V. How many of you are familiar with uh, Shakespeare's Henry V. Kenneth Branagh did an ac excellent job doing that, uh, turning it into a movie, great movie. The Battle of Agincourt, in which um, 1415 virtually wiped out a generation of the French nobility. Thousands and thousands were slaughtered. So put France into a very bad uh, situation. And a little bit later, the Treaty of Noyes, in which uh, Henry V marries Princess Catherine and becomes the heir to the throne in this treaty. In 1422, Henry V and Charles VI die. <coughs> Charles VII, who uh, was a very unfortunate uh, youngster came into his own much later in his life, but um, he was not a very impressive character. Um, I have a description by a contemporary that described him as physically and mentally, Charles was a weakling and a graceless degenerate. He was stunted and puny with a blank face in which scared, sleepy eyes peering out on either side of a big, long nose failed to animate his harsh, unpleasant features. So that's what some people thought of him. And compounding this problem is that uh, Burgundy, which is supposed to be part of France, the Duke of Burgundy had this feud with Charles, because Charles was involved um, in the uh, death of his father. So Burgundy is now fighting France along with England. Queen Isabella, who uh, was a rather promiscuous queen, uh, had 11 children, and many of them, or some of them, are thought to be uh, not Charles VI. So, and, and Queen Isabella actually told Charles uh, VII that uh, she didn't think that uh, he, his father was the king because she was having affairs with other men. So Charles, a, a fairly weak sort of person with a, a terrible complex because he had a horrible mother uh, is now, uh, who is heir to the throne because his older brothers have, are die, have died. And here's a picture of Charles VII. Now, there were many in France that uh, didn't like the English and many who wanted the English to rule. France itself was very divided over this, and it, was, it did not help that they had such a, a weak sort of um, heir to the throne. Officially, he was not uh, anointed king. 
although people called him king anyway. The king is supposed to be anointed in Reims, but Reims was in northern France and taken over by the English. So they accepted the nobility who accepted him, called him king, but he was really the Dauphin, which is the prince. And so we come to the Siege of Orleans, or Orléans. Um, I, I, I'm very anglicized. I don't, I'm not very good at pronouncing French words, so I'm going to anglicize everything here. Um, the English are in control of northern France, including Paris. They lay siege to or Orleans in 1428. If they could take Orleans, they would be in control of a large uh, area of the Loire River, which is a very <laughs> fertile area and very necessary to France. They were surrounded on three sides. One of the problems that the English had is that there's an awful lot more French than there were English. And so they were spread very thin. And they had, once they took a town, they had to have a garrison there in many cases. And so they didn't have uh, the luxury of sending a lot of troops to Orleans. So they had it surrounded on three sides and working on the fourth. And they were going to starve the people out. And it looked awful for the French. Uh, they were very in a very depressed mood, and there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for the war, uh, many people thinking that it's only a matter of time that they were going to lose to the English. And while we're here, here's something that was relatively new in warfare, is the cannon. In the 1300s to 1400s, this was coming into prominence as the major uh, wall breaker. It's better than a trebuchet, although a lot more dangerous, because sometimes they would just explode and kill the people who are operating it. But it was very effective. You could hurl huge stones uh, a great long distance and hit the walls and do an awful lot of damage. And then there was the culvern of various sizes, some of which could be carried uh, on a man's shoulder. They were the precursors to the rifle, or the, the musket, I should say. Um, it was not something that you pulled a trigger, it's just a, a handheld cannon, basically. And if you held it on your shoulder, which some were small enough to do that. Um, you'd have another man light the fuse and you're basically holding a cannon that shoots uh, a rock uh, about an inch in diameter, maybe two inches. And you know, we can laugh about that sort of thing now. Back in those days, it was a scary weapon. It was really scary, especially if you got hit by one of these things, because it would do severe damage. So this is Orleans. And on this map, you can see the red marks where the, uh, the little forts that were set up by the English to surround the city were. Then we come to a young girl, Joan, born in 1412 to Jacques d'Arc and Isabel Romé. They said that to Isabel, her mother, her informal last name was Rome because she may have taken a trip to Rome uh, on a pilgrimage in her life earlier on. They were living in Domremy in eastern France, a very small town, maybe a hundred people or so. And um, Jacques was both a farmer and a minor official in the town. Joan, in her early years, was known for being a very, uh, both well-behaved and very pious young girl. Um, she loved going to mass. She uh, would see, she would often be seen uh, praying before the Virgin Mary statue outside the the uh, church. And this 
is the home of Joan of Arc that is still standing. It is now a museum, of course, and people can go visit that and, um, and see where Joan of Arc lived. Do they know that for sure? Yes, yes. This is not one of those debatable sort of things. They, they know for sure that this is her house. Because from early on, she was the icon that everybody uh, really looked up to. And so people wanted to know, where is this girl from? So Joan, at the age of 13, says that she's hearing voices. Now, she doesn't tell anybody this at first. She's 13 years old, and she hears voices, first of all, just encouraging her to be a good girl, but then also uh, encouraging her to stay a virgin. And so at 16, um, her father, we're not sure of the details of this, we just know from the court records that um, she was brought to court. But we're assuming from some of the other things that we know that her father made a, a marriage for her, uh, for a, 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 another young man in town, and Joan didn't want to marry him and said so. And so when the marriage was called off, uh, the man took Joan to court and said, um, this was a breach of promise. I was promised her in marriage. She broke the promise. And so I'm bringing her to court for some sort of damages, I suppose. Um, she was found not guilty because uh, she, in fact, never promised anything. It was most likely her father who promised her in marriage. Now, also, as we know, this was a time during the Hundred Years' War in which soldiers periodically would raid the countryside in search of provisions. And in 1428, uh, Joan and her family had to go stay at uh, a relative's house in the next town over because of this raid. And it made a real impact on Joan, as you might imagine. And as a woman who's hearing voices from angels and saints, this would definitely affect her. So here's a very nice painting. And you can see the, uh, this is Michael the archangel here. And there's another either angel or saint. <coughs> and she's hearing these voices again. And she knows, because really everybody knows at least some details of the battles that are going on, she has heard that Orleans is under siege. And so her voices tell her that she's the one chosen by God to go uh, lift the siege and push the English out of France. The voices that she's hearing are from St. Margaret and St. Catherine and St. Michael the Archangel. This was kind of a new one to me. Uh, I had always heard of Michael the Archangel. I didn't know that he was also called a saint, and maybe that's just a Catholic thing. But uh, anyway, um, St. Margaret and St. Catherine. Um, significant that those are the two that are speaking to her. They, were both, they both died virgins uh, around about the year uh, 304, 305, uh, from Roman persecutions. They were both martyred. And they both were under pressure to give up their virginity, and both of them very heroically uh, kept it, at least, and that's the stories that uh, were given. So they command Joan to raise the siege, and, and really the, the two big things that she says they were commanding her to do to raise the siege and have the Dauphin uh, anointed king. Because even though people were calling him king, he was not officially anointed. And this is Charles, right? Charles, yes. Charles VII. Who, he officially becomes Charles VII on his coronation. How old was he at this time? Um, he was about 28, 29. So, Without telling her parents, knowing her parents do not want her to, 
she was going to go on this mission. Her father had told her mother and brothers that he had had a dream of Joan, and the dream was that she was going to follow or, or hang out with soldiers and be one of the camp followers uh, among soldiers. And we all know what women are who follow soldiers back in those days. They are not women who go out and help lead armies. They are prostitutes. And she, uh, her father told her brothers, if she ever does this, I want you to drown her in the nearest river. And if you don't, I will. So her father had very strong feelings about this sort of thing, as you might imagine. But Joan goes away, tells her parents that she's going to stay with her uncle in uh, the local town, but knowing also that that's her connection to the Dauphin. There is a larger town about 12 miles away, and I wish I could pronounce this. Uh, does anybody want to give a shot at this one? Vaucoulers? Vaucoulers? Very good, thank you. Um, so anyway, um, Captain Baudricourt, who was the in charge of the uh, uh, military at that uh, in that town, she goes to him and tells him that she has been chosen by her lord to help raise the siege of Orleans, and. When he asks, well, who is your Lord, thinking that some guy has put her up to this, she says, God, at which he laughs in her face, tells her to go home. She needs to be boxed by the ears by her father. But she doesn't give up. She's there in Val Cooler. Um, and um, she's very determined and very confident. This is something that everybody notices about her, that she is entirely, utterly self-confident. She's 17 at this time, and she has complete and utter confidence in the voices that she has heard, and that God is going to bring her victory. And because of this, she makes a name for herself locally. She's staying with her uncle. People start to take notice and believe her. And before too long, messages are sent to the Dauphin saying that there is a girl who has been chosen by God and she looks authentic. Now, this is a time, you, you have to understand, this is a time when it was not that unusual for a young person, young woman, young man, to come up to people and say, I have been chosen by God to do whatever. That's not that unusual. What is unusual in this case, Joan of Arc, was completely believable. She did not appear to be nuts like most people would who claim such things. And she was very articulate despite the fact she was completely illiterate no education whatsoever except for a, a, a religious education that was given to her by her mother. So completely uneducated, almost, completely illiterate, and she goes and convinces people by the force of her personality that she has been chosen by God. And so the... Uh, the Dauphin and his entourage hear about this, and you know historians are basically saying he was grasping at straws. It was a very desperate time for him, and so for him to say, "Yeah, sure, bring her," um, was most likely an act of desperation. And so, and so the the captain in the town gave her a seven man escort and men's clothes to wear. At this time, this is when she starts to wear men's clothes instead of women's, which was a real big deal back in those days. The Old Testament is very clear that God sees it as an abomination 
for a woman to wear men's clothes. And they are all very cognizant of that fact. But she was given men's clothes, and uh, they cut her hair. She wanted her hair cut, so she got that really nice little bobbed look. And, um, and she has to travel 350 miles through enemy-controlled territory, for the most part. And the soldiers that escorted her, initially, they testified this later, initially, they were going to make some moves on her. She is a very shapely sort of woman. Uh, and by the way, uh, in, on more than one occasion, in various testimonies, men have brought out the fact that she had very nice breasts. Why they would do that in a testimonial, I don't know, but that really struck them, that she had really beautiful breasts. Now, she was never said to be pretty in the sense of having a pretty face, but she seemed to be a very athletic, certainly athletic sort of woman or young girl. And um, the soldiers who initially were thinking of uh, making a move on her uh, decided that they wouldn't because she was such a pious and strong sort of person who was quite determined to preserve her virginity. Uh, and, and by the way, virginity back in those days was a very big deal. As you know, a woman who has fallen from grace in, in, in those sorts of days are usually the, the woman who has had sex before marriage. That was a very big deal. And it was almost like, um, you might compare it to Samson and his long hair. As long as he never cut his hair, he retained his magical strength. Joan, as long as she remained a virgin, remained in God's favor and would retain the, uh, the strength of character that she had. So anyway, the soldiers grew to respect her, and it only took 11 days, do the math, that's, that's an awful lot of miles to cover uh, each day. 350 miles through enemy territory, most often traveling at night. And they arrived 11 days later at Chinon, where the king, or the Dauphin, was. So, there's a, a very famous scene, and it, <clears throat> if you watch any of the movies of Joan of Arc, this is a really big deal, that she walks into a hall, there's like 300 people there. And in the movies, they will tell you, or they'll, they'll set up a scene where someone else is acting as the king, and she walks, and sitting on his throne where he's supposed to be, and they're trying to trick her into thinking that someone else is the king. This is a test. It didn't really happen exactly like that. The testimony that we got later was that uh, the king, in the midst of these 300 people or so, um, did not make himself obvious. Walked around at least uh, behind other people and was not going to show himself as the king to her. She had to pick him out, and she did. <coughs> so, uh, and this is another interesting thing that historians kind of wrangle over. Uh, was this a miracle? Did Joan's voices uh, point out the king to her? And as historians, they will usually find a way to say, you know, she was probably with somebody who knew the king. Also, his features were generally well known. As I described him, as you saw in the picture, he had kind of a long nose and droopy eyes and a very, uh, not a very majestic sort of person. And so it's very possible that she picked him out because she kind of knew what he looked like anyway. But if you want to believe in miracles, you can certainly do that too. So um, once she comes up to him, uh, as is uh, expected in such cases, she goes down to her knees, she grabs his ankles and tells him that, um, let's see, I, th I think I have the quote. Uh, 
basically that she has come to relieve Orleans and uh, have him crowned uh, at Reims, and that's and that God had sent her. So uh, he takes her aside, or she tells him, "I must speak with you privately." And so they go off into another room privately. They have a conversation. We don't know what that conversation was. Some people speculate that uh, she told him something that only he knew, something that he had prayed for, or something. Uh, in any case, he comes out of the room completely convinced that uh, she's been uh, sent by God. And so, but that's not good enough because Charles has other people who need to be uh, convinced as well. So a team of 17 or 18 uh, clergymen interrogate her for three weeks, which is kind of an amazing thing. I mean, what are you going to ask for three weeks? Um, but they did. They spent three weeks questioning her uh, about her voices. Why is it that she thinks she's chosen by God to do this? And uh, what kind of person are you? Unfortunately, this was, these, the transcripts of this, these proceedings have been lost. Um, and so we don't know exactly what was said, although we have a few quotes and uh, basically the quotes that we have uh, show her to be uh, extremely bold on the verge of being rude uh, when asked um, simple questions like do you believe in God she would answer better than you <laughs> when asked about the voices did they speak or, or what what dialect of French do they speak? She said, better than yours. Because uh, some of the uh, questioners uh, were come from, had come from different parts of France and they would have different sorts of dialects and accents. And apparently the, the guy who was asking this had a thick accent of some sort. Um, so she made that comment to him. So also, she had to be examined by women to make sure that she was a virgin. And they said, yes, she is a virgin. And so she was accepted. And here's an artist rendering of Joan meeting the Dauphin. So she is given an escort, and, oh, first of all, she's given a suit of armor, specially made for her. She is a woman. She has, as they say, beautiful breasts, so that needs to be taken into account when uh, given a suit of armor. And apparently, Joan, at this time, uh, was really getting into the whole men's fashion thing. At this time, uh, France, along with other parts of Europe, is getting more and more fancy with silks and other imports from the East, uh, fabrics that they hadn't previously had. And so uh, the men and women of the day, uh, if you had the money, would buy uh, the best finery you could. And Joan was really into this. And so she got her suit of armor and she had a, uh, a cloak of gold cloth to cover it and other flouncy sorts of things to go along, whether a big long ostrich feather or whatever. Um, but it was noted by many that uh, she was not just some rugged grunt soldier. She was dressed nicely. And she has her banner made, um, this long, it, it, it was believed to be about 12 feet long white banner uh, with, on one side, the world with angels on it, on the other side, um, Mary and Jesus, and then it had the fleur-de-lis design on it as well. And once she's all decked out in her finery, she sends a message to the English to leave France or else. 
and and it was a very strong worded message. Um, her messenger, by the way, was not returned. Uh, they kept him as they did most of her messengers until she complained that she was going to kill some French prisoners unless she got her messengers back. English. Yeah, sorry. Okay. English. Um, so she arrives at Orleans and the, uh, the man in charge of the defense of Orleans was um, called the Bastard of Orleans. That was not a pejorative. He was in charge. He was the bastard son of the Duke. And um, that was OK. In the 1400s, that if you were from nobility, it's OK to be a bastard. And he was. And so his, he was known as the bastard of Orleans. And nobody thought of that as a bad thing. Today it sounds kind of funny coming up to say, are you the bastard? <laughs> because that, that's what she did. She came up to him, and um, when she arrived, uh, she William the Conqueror was also a bastard. He was known as William the Bastard before he became the Conqueror. Oh, well, how about that? I didn't, I've never known that. William yeah. the Bastard, okay. Her mother, uh, his mother was a laundry woman <laughs> who uh, caught the eye of uh, Son. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There were, um, as, as you, I'm sure, well know that if you were a duke or a king and you were married, it was, it was almost expected that you had mistresses because almost all of them did. And so you had bastards. And it was such a commonplace thing that, um, like I said, it was expected. And so, and, and these bastard children, although they couldn't completely inherit their father's titles, um, the bastard could not be king, uh, they could be given other titles. They could be a duke. And this was, uh, this guy later became one. So Joan arrives in Orleans and she was tricked. She kept telling everybody, I want to, when I get there, I want to attack right away. She's a very impatient sort of young girl, and she was not going to put up with any delays. And she said, I want to attack as soon as we get there. <coughs> but she wasn't going to. The bastard of Orleans, along with his counselor, said, look, we got to get some supplies into Orleans. They have been cut off. They're very low on supplies. So uh, Orleans, as we saw in that other map, and we'll see this uh, map again, is on the uh, other side of the Loire, on the, the north side of the Loire River, and they needed to get supplies from the south to the north. They needed to get it across the river, and that's what uh, the bastard of Orleans, his first priority was to uh, get those supplies into town. So we have um, the scene where Joan meets the Bastard of Orleans. Do we have, does he have a name? Um, Jean, Jean or John, John the Bastard. Yeah. They always change things around in French, it, it does. <laughs> but it, it's, it's John. Okay, um, so she goes up to him and says, are you the Bastard of Orleans? And he says, yes, I am. Did you give the order that I should come here to this side of the river instead of where the English are. He says, yes, we planned this out because in council, we decided the best thing to do is to uh, safely come on this side and uh, get the supplies into Orleans. And she answers, in God's name, the counsel of God is safer and wiser than yours. I bring you better help than any knight or any city. I bring you the help of the king of heaven. Pretty bold statement when you first meet somebody and you're a 17-year-old girl talking to a guy who's 28, 29 years old and a grizzled old uh, military veteran. But that's the kind of thing that she very frequently did. So 
They got the supplies in. Oh, another thing. Here's another one of uh, Joan's supposed miracles. They were waiting for the wind to turn so that they, the sails would furl and they could get across the river. And, um, and they were waiting. And Joan says, basically, uh, don't worry about that. It'll happen. And as soon as she arrives and makes this statement, the wind changes. And they're like, whoa, this is pretty, <laughs> this is pretty creepy stuff. Pretty amazing. So uh, they get their supplies across the river. They bring it in into town. And everybody is ecstatic, not just about the supplies. They are absolutely mad with joy to see Joan of Arc, only it's really Joan the Maid. As I said, nobody ever called her Joan of Arc in her lifetime. That was a much later thing. She called herself the Maid. So she would be known as Joan the Maid for those who loved her. Uh, for the English, she was more like Joan the, uh, the Harlot, or the, yeah, the Witch. So they brought in the supplies. She enters Orleans, great crowds of people wanting to touch her, believing, as many did in those days, if you have a person who is sent by God, they must be magical. And if I have something wrong with me, I can touch them and get healed. Joan was very open about the fact that she was not a miracle worker. And she told people many times that she did not perform miracles of that sort. Uh, there is a time when a woman come, came up to her and said that uh, the, the soldiers want you to come and touch them, uh, that they will be healed of their wounds if you come and touch them. She told the woman, go and touch them yourself. It will do just as much good. She was very clear on that. So, but she was seen as the savior of the day and people were just mad, crazy, uh, to see her and they flocked around her. She had a very difficult time uh, getting off of her horse and getting into her lodgings because so many people wanted to see her. And here she is with her banner. Great painting. So, the first battle is of a, a little fort a mile or two down the road that, um, that they, were they needed to uh, take out to keep the one gate that they had still open uh, free and clear from enemy soldiers. The battle, it took a few days because the, uh, the Bastard of Orleans was still waiting on reinforcement to uh, show up. So they had to wait a few days they started the battle without her. Uh, the bastard, although he liked Joan, he was not entirely convinced yet uh, that she would do much good. So Joan wakes up and realizes that, that the battle is going on. She hurriedly gets her, and she has attendants to help her put on her uh, armor, get her stuff together, ride out into the battle. She comes out right at the time when the French are retreating. They've been beaten back. They are, she sees some wounded men coming and the whole crowds of French soldiers who have been beaten by the English, and she rallies them. She tells them that, as, as always, God is on our side. Come back. And as when they saw her, they took great inspiration. They took courage. They turned around. And they came back, and they routed the English fort and took it. At that point, the people who were already uh, crazy about Joan were ecstatic. She is for real. So, and here's St. Luke is over here. The, uh, the gate... This road was the last uh, road, last gate that was open for supplies to come through, and it had this little fort next to it that, was, that made it very difficult. And so they took this fort, and so now this road was completely open for them to bring in supplies. 
And, um, and as, as you know, there's many movies out there of historical events and characters that I really don't like. They always change <coughs> what really happened. There is one movie that I really do like, despite the fact that they change a number of things, and that is, in 1999, a movie called The Messenger. And I want you to listen to this little scene. Kind of ruins the whole thing. <laughs> well, sorry about that. It, it's worked before. It's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody silenced Joan. That was a miracle. <laughs> anyway, um, if you've ever seen this movie, I, I highly recommend it. Um, The, the early parts of the movie and the last part of the movie, I don't care for much because it, it's kind of way off. Uh, but kind of the central part of the movie where she is this impetuous young girl uh, trying to get along with these soldiers who basically take her and um, the, the bastard of Orleans is actually really well done in this movie too and he's trying to be patient with this very impatient young girl. No, that's actually the English who coming out. I think. So, anyway. So the second battle is across the river. And as you see in this map, there, once, there was a bridge across that was destroyed by the French so that the English couldn't cross it. But the English were in control of a little monastery right here, Augustine uh, Monastery, and um, kind of a, a bridge tower right here. And that was the next target to be taken. At this point, Joan is allowed in the war councils because they see that she's got something. And so um, they planned it out, they crossed the river, and at one point, again, the, uh, the French troops are, are faltering, they're falling back, Joan rallies them, and, and she's wounded with a, uh, a crossbow <laughs> bolt, an arrow, from the neck down through the shoulder and we don't know how deep it went, but it, it evidently couldn't have gone too deep because she was taken from the field and uh, she was patched up. Uh, she rested a little while and then came back. Um, and at the end of the day, and this is actually a two day uh, battle, but at the end of the second day, they were going to back off. They had done enough. They hadn't gotten it. Um, and Joan begs, says, one more time, kind of like uh, Henry V, once more through the breach. And, um, and they do. And she rallies them, she goes and attacks, and the, the little bastion there is taken. At that point, the English, who have now lost two sides to the city, realize that um, they're not going to win. They're not going to defeat Orleans. The siege is going to have to be lifted. And so the next day after they lost this one battle, they line up in battle array, battle formation, looking like it's going to be another battle. Joan realizes, sorry, uh, this is a Sunday. 
We don't fight on Sunday. She told her soldiers, we will line up. If they attack us, we certainly have to defend ourselves, but we are not going to attack them. And so the two armies had lined up against each other across the field. The English then just march away. And May 8th, the Sunday that they marched away, is now celebrated each year in Orleans as a holiday. Let's see if we got, maybe not sound, but at least you can see. This is the annual parade, Joan of Arc Day. They got a rather large Joan of Arc that time. Crossing the bridge. And so the first part of her uh, first part of her uh, job was basically done. She lifted the siege of Orleans, and now she has to get the king anointed. The king is still somewhat reluctant. Um, after taking some smaller towns in the area, um, she goes to Charles, now we have to go and get you anointed king. And unfortunately, still, Reims is behind the lines, as it were, and they needed to take a number of towns on the way, and they did. And again, Joan is inspiring the soldiers to take these towns. She came and they got to Reims, and Joan, during this ceremony, is standing next to Charles with her banner in full armor, and she was asked later, why is it that your banner got to be there with the king and none of the other banners of the soldiers were allowed? And she said, my banner did all the work. It deserves the honor. <laughs> and there she is, next to the king, being crowned. At that point, this is the high point of Joan's career. The magic seems to have been lost. She had said initially that her goal, her mission, was to relieve the siege of Orleans and get the uh, Dauphin anointed king. And she had hinted at this point that her job was done. But apparently, um, she, she kind of liked being a soldier. She liked leading men into battle. She was not going to give it up. And so, even though Charles, who was kind of eager to be done with all this warfare stuff, wars are very expensive. All throughout history, any war that has ever been fought is always very expensive. And Charles, uh, not being a very uh, thrifty sort of person, not very good with money, or his uh, entourage, who are supposed to handle these sorts of things, very chaotic time and taxes often were not collected, and so he was always short of funds. His soldiers are always complaining that they uh, have not gotten paid. Supplies are very often lost. It was not easy being a soldier back in those days. Uh, for many of the men, the best thing you could look forward to is plundering a town, because then you can get food and steal stuff. So anyway, um, they tried to take Paris, they couldn't take it. They failed. Joan failed. And it was, a, it was a very difficult blow for her. Afterwards, she spent some time at court with Charles, uh, didn't care for it much, um, and then went out to battle again. She went to a town, a La Charity, and failed. She goes to relieve uh, Compagnie, I think I'm doing that right, Compagnie? What? Compiègne. Compiègne, thank you. Um, and it's that, at that point, is where she's captured. 
it was a kind of a forlorn hope to relieve the, the uh, impending siege of Com say that again? Compiègne. Compiègne. Um, because she had very few soldiers in comparison with the, uh, and it, it, by the way, this was uh, the Burgundians that she's fighting against at this point. As we know, that the English and the Burgundians were in league together fighting against uh, the Dauphin in France. And um, as she was being hurled back from her advance, Joan, being the brave soldier that she was, still 17, she was fighting in the rear guard. She had about 400 soldiers with her. They were going back to Com Compiègne. 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 Uh, and, um, but she was mixing it up with the soldiers. The Burgundians were kind of there. So several of the soldiers, the French soldiers, got into town, and it was getting too thick. So the, uh, the mayor, the lord of the town, closed the gates. He was not going to let the enemy inside. Joan, with a few of her soldiers left, was left outside, and she was captured. And here's a nice painting of Joan with her gold uh, cloak over. She was basically grabbed by the cloak and yanked off the horse. And now, Joan is in prison. Probably the, the worst situation for her, a very active, probably hyperactive young girl, now enclosed in a prison. She was captured by soldiers from the Duke of Luxembourg, who was in league with the, the Bur Duke of Burgundy. She tried twice to escape. The first time, all she had to do was lift some floorboards prisons not being what they are today, she lifted up some floorboards and snuck out. They captured her right away. She couldn't get far. The second time, she leaped from a tower 60 feet high. And there is some uh, question as to whether she was either trying to escape or commit suicide. And even she was not clear on this in the testimonies later. This was something that they held against her, because suicide is a, a mortal sin in the Catholic faith. And uh, she would say things like, um, I would rather die than be in prison the rest of my life, so I decided to jump. And then they would ask her, so you were committing suicide, right? And she said, well, no, I wasn't trying to commit suicide. I was just trying to get away. So. Anyway, and um, she was sold to the English, 10,000 pounds, which was not an exorbitant amount, but it was a, still a good chunk of change of those days, and uh, quite uh, noticeably, King Charles, who owed everything to her, uh, did nothing to help her. He may have sent a letter of protest, and that's about it. And this is the tower from which Joan left. She was unconscious for a couple of days. And uh, she eventually recovered. Uh, apparently, and, and strangely enough, she had broken no bones. So the ground below uh, must have been fairly soft. Or it was another miracle, as some people will say. So after several months of wrangling and getting a trial together, and this was like eight months she was in prison, after her second attempt, um, she was chained to her bed. Uh, so there was the bishop, uh, and here's another one, I need your help. Kaochong? 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 Kaochong. Okay. Uh, was the lead judge, a very uh, hateful sort of man, who was out to get Joan. Roughly about 60 churchmen, including clerks, to take down the minutes, and we're very thankful that they did. Um, and some of them were very conscientious about doing this. There was one in particular who went around, and there was, I don't know how many there were, but there was certainly more than one, 
But one guy in particular uh, went to the others. He noticed that some of them were fudging. This trial was meant to condemn Joan. This a lot the trial, the French or the English? This is the English. But it's French uh, priests who were doing it, who were sided with the English. And what was he charged with? Um, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But um, so the, uh, this one particular clerk um, was very conscientious, even though there's a lot of pressure from the English to make sure this was done, that she was condemned. So <coughs> some of the clerks were fudging, and they would change some of the testimony to make her look bad. And this one clerk, to his credit, uh, would confront them and say, no, that's not what she said, and made sure that it was done right. So we are fairly confident that what we have is her real words. Um, and uh, there were a few, two or three of these priests who knew that this was not a fair trial, that they were out to condemn her no matter what, and they made their protests. Some of them just left. One was arrested and put in prison, at least for a short time. Um, so it was, it was a foregone conclusion. She was interrogated not for three weeks, like the others, uh, the, the other uh, inquiry. This was three months of questioning. She is now 19 years old, but it's absolutely amazing if you read some of her statements. And some of the statements, by the way, I've given to you in the handout. She stands very boldly and tells them very strongly uh, what, she's, what she believes God has chosen her and, um, and that they should beware because uh, she is sent from God. Now, what is she charged with? She's charged with heresy, number one. The idea that she has been spoken to by angels and saints, they have a hard time with that because you are either uh, a great chosen by God person or you are a heretic. There's, there's no in-between there. The other thing that they were getting her on was that she was wearing men's clothes. And as any good uh, Catholic in Europe can tell you, as we said before, the, the Old Testament is very clear that God sees it as an abomination that a woman would wear man's clothes. And yes? Um, the Old Testament was rejected. There are many, many rules that, uh, You're talking to the wrong guy here. <laughs> he, okay. So you should have been so at the trial. <laughs> one thing out uh, while ignoring uh, hundreds of other commandments. Yeah, yeah. That was one that they were going to stick with. So, so anyway, um, and as, as one of the quotes uh, that I've given you, she was quite clear that she was going to stay with her men's outfit. She did not want to give it up. Now they told her, one of the things that she really missed being in prison, uh, she was not allowed to uh, go to mass and do confession. And they would sometimes tell her, look, if we gave you women's clothes, would you put them on uh, and then you could go to confession and hear mass? And she said, you know, to do mass, yes, I will put on women's clothes, but when I'm done, I'm gonna put the men's clothes back on. Now, one of the reasons we are sure, uh, at least, that she wanted to wear men's clothes is a very practical one. Once she had tried to escape and now changed, chained to her bed, they put four English guards to watch her. Gar prison guards back in those days were not chosen because they're nice people. They're chosen to be rough and tough and not very nice. And she was, on a number of occasions, um, assaulted by them. And uh, we're pretty sure they tried to rape her. They did not succeed, but uh, they were horribly abusive to her throughout her imprisonment, calling her a whore and, and all other uh, awful names that you might imagine, or what, uh, whatever they had back in those days to call uh, bad people 
Uh, she, was, she was abused terribly. So, so the questions, a lot of the questions centered around her, um, her clothes and the voices. And, oops, here's Joan at court, standing very boldly. In the end, they drew up 70 articles against her, and then they condensed them down into 12. And by the way, you can look these up. Just uh, Google 12 articles against Joan of Arc, and they'll list it right out. Each one is like a paragraph or two. And they basically talk mostly about her voices and her clothes. A, a couple other things, uh, basically, uh, she disobeyed her parents when she left. And so that's a big deal, too. That's one of the Ten Commandments. You've got to honor your father and mother. So that's another thing that they threw at her. And a couple of other little things. It's not very well organized, but it's there. So at one point, at the end of the trial, uh, the uh, bishop leads her out into a courtyard. This is where you're going to be burned at the stake. And he's preaching a sermon condemning her. At the end of the sermon, Joan reconsiders and thinks about uh, being burned at the stake, and she recants. I will submit to the church. And by the way, that's another charge. If you are not obeying the mother church, uh, that's another charge of heresy or apostasy. Um, so she recants. I don't want to burn. I will submit. And so they hand something to her to sign a confession. And the one thing that she can do is sign her name. We have that still today. Uh, that, but that was the only thing. She didn't know what she was signing. And so um, she signed this. She's repenting, thinking that she would go to a, a woman's prison or a church prison and be guarded by women. That's what she had sought the whole time. And they said, OK, now that you are uh, recanting, that's great. You are going to spend the rest of your life in an English prison with men. And a few days later, she decides, you know what, I would rather die than do that. So, and, and she says that her voices are telling her that she did wrong into, in uh, recanting. So she takes it back, and she's sent to the stake May 30th, 1431. She's burned. And um, bur being burned at the stake, as you might imagine, is a horrible way to go. And they made sure that it was worse than it needed to be. If you are burned at the stake, they can make it relatively fast if they put a whole bunch of wood on there and light it up, and you're dead within 10 minutes or so. She took a half an hour to die. By the end, she, they, testimony was that she, her last words were Jesus. She screamed out Jesus several times before she died. And the people around who were watching uh, were almost universally uh, in tears, feeling very horrible for her, even the ones who had hated her. Um, But the spirit of Joan lives on. Charles, afterwards, and it still took some time, but the tide was turning. And historians will tell you it was most likely Joan that did this. The spirit of the French started to rise, thinking of the, uh, the enthusiasm, this messenger sent by God. And slowly but surely, the French people made it more and more difficult for the English to hold territory in France. By 1435, Charles has taken Paris back. He has reconciled with Burgundy, so that civil war is over too. And he pardons everyone in Paris. And that made them absolutely love him. Charles was now coming into his own becoming the king that he could be and should be. 
1453, he takes Bordeaux, and that is the official end of the Hundred Years' War. <coughs> And then they come back to Joan. Many people knew that that was a show trial, that she was railroaded and should receive a second trial. And so there were actually three real rehabilitation trials. The first one was like a preliminary hearing. They get a few uh, uh, witnesses together. And then they did another one and found that uh, she really was a good Catholic. And then the third one was the official one for the Catholic Church. 115 witnesses. They got everybody that had ever known Joan that was still alive who would show up uh, from childhood friends, priests, the bell ringer who witnessed, who testified that Joan would plead with him. If he ever forgot to ring the bell, she would either plead with him or teasingly tell him that she was going to box his ears if, she, if he forgot again. And of course, soldiers would show up and uh, testify on her behalf. And so by 1456, the original trial uh, was pronounced null and void. And in 1920, she became a saint. Any questions, comments? I know I've gone over, I'm sorry about that, but there's so much about Joan that was needed to be covered. Yes? It seems the first trial by the, the clerics, they seem to be backing the very good news. And then they switch sides, and then the church ratified that after a number of years. Yeah. So they, the question here is the position of the church. The, the church was in a bad spot <laughs> at first. Um, they, the Pope um, did not want to go against England because England was the rising power at the time. Uh, they were asked, uh, the bishop asked um, the uh, Grand Inquisitor. He wanted this to be an inquisition, like, like the Spanish Inquisition, the, the head guy to come. He didn't come. He was busy uh, with other trials. Uh, so it wasn't an, a complete inquisition. Uh, but, as I said, the, the Pope was not going to do anything about it because the pressure from the English. Now, when it came to the other trial, um, the Pope, there was a new Pope, and he was perfectly willing to accept, uh, now that the French were in ascension and in power, they were perfectly happy to accept that Joan was a good Catholic. Anything else? Yes? Any feel for how unusual or how commonplace it was back in those days for people to claim to talk with angels, saints, God? I, I mentioned earlier that it was not that unusual. As a matter of fact, when she was in that town with the long name starting with V, Valcouleur. Are you French? No, but I lived a long time. In okay. France. You're very good, very good. Uh, when she was there, there was a woman who also claimed to hear voices from God and wanted to help out as well. Um, unfortunately, she was a mother with kids. She was not a virgin, so that was a big strike against her. Also, she was not nearly as credible as Joan, and Joan herself told her, go back to your family and uh, serve your husband and take care of your kids. So no, it was not that unusual. But like I said, uh, most people who claim to be uh, spoken to by God clearly look like they're nuts. Uh, Joan did not. And so she stood out because of that. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. We have Henry VIII. He's another great one. You can't miss that one.